Hey Acers, welcome to this week's Ace Role Playing Games Club channel, official podcast, and yeah, I like I said, I promise I'll eventually figure out how to make this actually into a podcast. Maybe I need to just record it on Audacity and put it up on Anchor or something, I don't know yet. But I got Audacity upgraded yesterday and I used it for the live stream. Sorry for no picture on the live stream, that made it boring and I'm sorry about that. But um, the live stream was put up there more for the audio and I was hoping that there would be a visual component to go with it, but unfortunately, ever since I installed OBS, which I do use for other streaming things, I've kind of had a problem with getting things to actually work right here with my camera. Um, so I actually have to go into my camera app and then use it. Anyway, I'm going to mention here today... Um, a few more things, a few shout outs and things like that. And, and a thank you to everybody who came to Savage Saturday yesterday. It was a pretty small turnout, but we're going to try and do a better one in October. I'm just wondering if it was the back to school time period or whatever that kind of just killed our possible attendance. But regardless, in October, and I will get you that very exact date. Give me two seconds. Okay. And that will be Saturday, October 26th. And it will be starting at 10 a.m. We'll have up to three games. We only did two games yesterday because we only had three people still when it came 6 o'clock. There were no other people who were interested in it. We didn't have a sign on the door, and that was kind of a, a bad thing that we should have made sure that um, was re that the store had it ready. I'm going to try and actually put together some good advertising material for it, make some flyers this next time, have um, Mythos print them out because they're sponsoring it as well as other people can sponsor it too. And we're going to try and have us a blowout of a Q4 Savage Saturday. And this Q4 Savage Saturday, I'm hoping we have a lot of great fun that comes to it. I'm hoping actually probably to run again um, one foggy Krampus Eve because it's the Christmas time period for that episode. And so we'll, we'll do it in October. I know it's kind of, kind of yeah, a little bit off there. But I don't know, maybe I'll just run it as a one shot this year in December when I run the when I run the monthly campaign night that that which, by the way, that monthly campaign night is actually coming up on the 26th or 29th of this month. So that'll be Saturday or Thursday, the 29th will be the next meeting for the for the more grown up table. So if you're 16 and up, you're welcome to come. That's store rules. So that said, let's talk about. Um, the fact that the Fallout game is actually off to a great start, although um, <laughs> we didn't have one of our players there this last time, and he's got a he's got a character that's more designed along the lines, and it's a compelling character, I would say. It's an interesting character. He's designed along the lines of not actually being a combat character, which he likes Fallout, and he plays Fallout, but he made a non-combat character who is all about befriending animals and has the little chihuahua. He wasn't there. And so we kind of have a rule as the club. If your character's not there, your character becomes an allied NPC. And for those of you who are completely new to the world of role-playing gaming, welcome in. This is a great place to start. But NPC is short for non-player character. So you'll sometimes, if somebody's missing, you'll have to run two characters. So that sometimes happens. But that said... I don't know if the game master just doesn't like his character or if it were, and, and it usually isn't because Jonah's turning out to be a pretty good game master and I'm pretty impressed with him. Um, but still the antagonists will go after characters and try and gang up on them and just defeat them and destroy them because, Hey, if the players can do it, why not the antagonists and the antagonists this time went after our animal friend guy and his animal and knocked them both down. But the flip side is that if um, when they come back is that they're going to get a chance to get healed because, hey, Fallout is the world of stim packs. Stim packs are just basically choop, jab myself with a sharp needle real quick and choop, I'm back up in 100% health. I like the world. I don't necessarily like some of the mechanics, but that's that's neither here nor there. And then we also had um, our other table going with its campaign um we, this was the last time for one for one of our graduate gms rune she is headed off to go to um, southern utah university we wish her luck and 
um, know that she'll be back around to probably play at the, at the grown-up table from time to time. Um, Clara is still going to be there. She's going to still be finishing up her campaign, and we're all going to try and finish at least this leg of the campaigning in about two more weeks, at which point we're going to pause all campaigns and shuffle around and either Jonah or possibly Clara, or we're going to see, you know, game master wise, who we can get. I want to get Char up there. Char is going to be awesome to get there too. And, um, I have to say that so far, those who've graduated from the game master training boot camps, you're doing great jobs. I actually need to go back into my notes and actually retool my game master boot camp slide deck and get that over to pinnacle and other places and, and make it so that can continue to grow. So let's talk now, speaking of Pinnacle, speaking of Savage Worlds, let's talk about traits. You're going to be called in Savage Worlds games to make a lot of trait roles. And traits are the attributes that define and skills that define the character. Now, going back a little bit, let's go back a little bit to the one I got over there on the shelf, the, uh, the original Deadlands. It has a really intricate and cool character creation system, and it uses playing cards and things like that, and it, it still was a little more random, like original Dungeons & Dragons was. But, the, sat, the Deadlands, when it got put into, when it got pushed through the sieve, and got put into the Great Rail Wars, that's where Shane Hensley... He is, Shane Lacey Hensley is one of the most amazing game creators I've ever met in my life. And I've only met him online, but I've chatted with him on video calls and stuff. And he is an awesome, 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 and amazing creator here. And I'm so glad we have him. I'm so glad he created Savage Worlds because he created, obviously, my favorite system. But what he did is he pushed the Deadlands through a sieve and made the Great Rail Wars and realized there that those traits of the characters that were being used in the Great Rail Wars as, as miniatures, those were actually usable in a role-playing game system, and that's how he created Savage Worlds, is he took all the great stuff that had come before Great Rail Wars and before Savage Worlds, up everything that Pinnacle had done up to 2003, and at two, in 2003 released Savage Worlds. And so traits are actually part of it, because that's where he realized you can be abstract in your, in your skills, and you can have it apply to multiple things. So let's talk about first attributes. Now this one here, I'm actually going to quote directly from the book because this is just important to understand. Attributes don't directly affect skill roles in Savage Worlds. Savage, okay, so attributes don't directly affect skill roles. Savage Worlds treats learned knowledge and training as the most relevant and direct factors. A high attribute allows one to increase a skill faster and opens up options to edges that greatly differentiate two characters with the same skill. Every character starts with a D4 in each of the five attributes. The five attributes are agility, which is a measure of a character's nimbleness, dexterity, and general coordination. Smarts measures raw intelligence, mental acuity, and how fast a heroine thinks on her feet. It's used to resist certain types of mental and social attacks. Spirit is self-confidence, backbone, and willpower. It's used to resist social and supernatural attacks as well as fear. And as, I, as we've observed before, it's also used to recover from being shaken, which I guess technically is kind of a social attack. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that more in a minute. Strength is a physical power is physical power and fitness is used as the basis of a warrior's damage in hand-to-hand -hand combat and to determine how much he can wear or carry and vigor represents an individual's endurance resistance to disease poison or toxins and how much physical damage she can take before she can't go on it's most often used to resist fatigue effects and as the basis for derived the derived stat of toughness now Attributes can fir attributes first determine how fast skills can increase during advancement, and they limit access to edges. So, they also derive secondary statistics such as toughness or melee damage, and how you resist effects such as being grappled or counter spells. 
or, or, or uh, counter spells, powers, or social attacks, such as taunt or intimidation. And also, it is how you get out of an area of effect attack. So we've covered what an attribute does and what it is. And one thing I liked about Savage Worlds when I first got introduced to it is the removal of, is, is that there were just the five traits. There's no charisma as a dump stat kind of thing. Each one of these five has a purpose and a meaning and a use. There is no, there is no point in shorting yourself on one unless that's your character build. So if you want your character to be not the brightest crayon on the Christmas tree, yes, I did use the mixed metaphor on purpose, then giving them a, a, um, a, a smarts of four, leaving their smarts at a D4, that's ultimately fine. If he's fighting McFighters from Fighter Town, but he chews crayons and he sticks them up his nose when he's not chewing on them, you know what? That's that's fine. That's absolutely fine. But if you want a character who's balanced, understand that in any trait, a D6 is average. So D4 represents basic exposure. D6 represents competency, represents that... 50% of the time you're usually right. D10 and uh, D8 is a case where you're a little bit better than average and you tend to succeed more often than you fail. D10 is going to be where you are now considered an expert, a leader in that field. And D12 is going to be where you are now not only the expert, but you're like the, the top teacher. You are the best at what you do. So that's how the die types come into play here. And then ultimately, your skills, which I'm not going to go through the whole skill list here. But in most settings, heroes start with 12 points. Sometimes in a more techno technological-based setting, heroes will start with 15. Because in a modern day, I, I usually say modern day or science fiction, you're going to go for for 15 and if you're going for anything pretty much before modern day 12 is just fine because in the older versions of savage worlds you used to get 15 but you had to buy things like notice and swimming or um running or jumping or things like that but the running jumping swimming that's one of the things that i will point out in the skills is they did a better abstraction job this time around. And this was kind of derided, actually, by some of the other people who had a podcast when Savage Worlds Adventure Edition came out. But athletics has now become a coordination skill. So I will read the one for athletics. I'll read the one for the five basic traits, the five basic skills that you get. And you have a D4 automatically in all of these because almost every adventurer has at least these. Now, if you want to take the can't swim hindrance then that will affect this athletics but athletics is based on your agility and it combines an individual's coordination with learned skills such as climbing jumping balancing biking wrestling skiing swimming throwing or catching characters who rely on physical power more than coordination can take the brute edge on page 38 of the current suede manual and to link this skill to strength instead of agility so that's one thing I never liked about Dungeons and Dragons is that your fighting is based on your, 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 your fighting, your swinging a sword and actually hitting is based on your strength. Whereas Savage Worlds, and I'll, I'll mention this in passing as well, uh, Savage Worlds changed it to agility is how you hit. It, so fighting is based on your agility. And since I'm passing that one right now, I'll read that one to you real quick because it's an important one. Fighting covers all hand-to-hand -hand and melee attacks, whether it's with fists, axes, laser swords, or martial arts. See Chapter 3 for the combat rules and various maneuvers and warrior, a warrior might attempt. And also, it should be mentioned here that fighting is what, is what determines your parry, which is a derived, a derived statistic. So, moving on. To the, so uh, athletics is the first, is the first of the five skills that you get a free D four in, 
So if you think about it, you're actually getting 17 points now as a base start instead of 15 points. So you actually gained two points. So if you don't, if you didn't want to lose that idea, you got, okay. So we have our athletics because you got to at least be able to move around a little bit. Common knowledge is the next one. Characters roll common knowledge to know people, places, and things of their world, including etiquette, geography, culture, popular technology, contacts, and customs. And in a modern setting, I allow common knowledge actually to cover driving. Now, I'll get to unskilled something, uh, unskilled things here in a moment. Um, the next one of our basic skills that we have here, I'm just scrolling through the, the longer list here, is notice. Notice is based on smarts. Notice is a hero's general awareness and alertness. It's used to sense sights, sounds, tastes, and smell, and smells. Spot clues, detect ambushes, spot hidden weapons on a foe, or tell if a rival is lying, happy, etc. Success conveys basic information. The character hears, move. The character hears movement in the forest, smells smoke, or senses someone isn't being completely truthful. A raise grants more detail, such as the direction of the sound, or odor or what topic a person is avoiding or lying about. So that's your next one. Then the next one, this one's actually kind of a useful one. And this kind of falls in going into the fallout, kind of falls into the charisma one. Persuasion, which is based on your spirit. Persuasion is the ability to convince others to do what you want through reason, cajoling, deception, rewards, or other friendly means. Persuasion isn't mind control. It can it can change someone's attitude, but not their goals. A bandit may let you keep a sentimental piece of jewelry with a good persuasion roll, but still taste all your other goods. When used to support allies, and support we'll get to, and we've kind of touched on it before, but we'll revisit that. Real, I'll just tell you real quick. Support is when you use a skill like persuasion to give to give a bonus to a person who's doing an action who's on your team so if you succeed you give them plus one if you raise you give them plus two but this is the warning if you critically fail you give them a minus two so just be prepared for that so when actually i'm going to have to pause for a second Okay, I, I just had to verify because I was like, what, or is it a minus one? If I, but no, critical failure does give minus two. So, when used to support allies, persuasion is an unopposed role. If the target is resistant, it's an opposed role, and the target's and, and that's opposed with the target's spirit. The game master should modify the role as they see fit. Based on the role, based on role playing and any pertinent edges or hindrances that affect the con the conversation and the circumstances. Now, reaction level is also calculated in here, and the reaction table is over here in the sidebar. But how much a person is willing to cooperate lar depends largely on their attitude towards whoever whoever's talking to them. The game master can decide how non-player characters feel on the setting or role on the reaction table. If she has no if she has no perceived notions of what the reaction is going to be. Success improves the target's attitude one level and a raise improves it two. Further increases aren't generally possible in the same account. It takes individuals a little time to adjust their biases. Failure means that the target won't change his mind this scene or until the situation changes in some important way. A critical failure also reduces the target's attitude two levels. Only one role should be generally allowed per interaction unless new information is revealed, a substantial reward is offered, etc. Now, networking, which we've covered, and it's on page 133 of the manual. Networking. Characters can also use persuasion as a macro skill, simulating a few hours or an, event or an evening's time hobnobbing and socializing to gain favors for information. So that is a skill, and, and as a game master, you should be familiar with this reactions table on page 33. That should be one that you pro I'm probably going to actually go through, and I got some nifty, I got some nifty flaggies 
And I should probably go through my core rule book and flag important tables like this. And that's actually something I might suggest for you as a game master as well. So let's try and wrap this up here. We're pushing 20 minutes and I'm trying to keep, well, I just hit 20 minutes and I'm trying to keep these shorter than 20 minutes now. So um, the next one of your basic five skills, so we just did persuasion, is going to be stealth. And it's right here. The fifth one is stealth. And that's based on agility. Stealth is the ability to hide and move quietly. A character's a, a simple success on a stealth roll means the character avoids detection if enemies aren't particularly alert. If the character fails the roll, the enemy realizes something is amiss and begins actively searching for whatever roused them. So that's going from passive to active searching. Once foes are alerted and active, stealth is a, opposed by notice. And there can be group roles if there's many foes. The Game Master should apply any circumstantial penalties to the notice rolls for darkness, cover, noise, distractions, and any, any, any difference in the target's scale, just like when attacking. And we, there's scale on page 106, and then the actual scale table is back on 173, I think. Sneaking through dry leaves might subtract, subtract two from the stealth roll. For example, while spotting someone in the dark, using uses the illumination penalty instead on the and that would be maybe a minus four. Don't apply the same modifier to both rolls, however. If stealth is at a minus two for the leaves, don't give notice a plus two for them as well. Sneak attack. Sneaking up close enough to make an attack, a melee attack, always requires an opposed stealth roll versus the target's notice, whether the guard is actively looking for trouble or not. If the victim is if, the, if successful, the stealth roll, the victim is vulnerable to the attacker, but only until the attacker's turn ends. With a raise, and that so that stealth roll is... that I'm going to have to look into this, because is stealth, if you're doing a sneak attack, and you make your stealth roll, is that just count as the attack itself? Or does that... Mm, that's a, a question I am going to actually have to ask. And I'm going to write down to ask that question. So, okay, I'm back from the pause and I've actually figured it out. The vulnerable gives whatever's done next against that target a plus two. So you would most likely have to declare a multi-action. You would have to take a stealth at a minus two to sneak up on the, on the guard. And then, but it doesn't say stealth roll minus two, so it might still actually be just a straight stealth roll. You would get a minus two to your fighting, but you get a plus. I'm, I'm actually going to have to dig into this one. This is kind of worded a little odd, and I it's got me thinking about it. But anyway, but um, you can get a raise and get the drop on your enemy entirely if you get a raise on your stealth roll. In movement, in combat, characters roll stealth each turn as a free action at the end of... Okay, so that's probably what it is. Stealth is a free um, there's no post still, I'm going to have to look into this. And so see, there's still things that I'm learning about the system, but anyway, as far as movement goes in combat, characters roll stealth each turn as a free action at the end of their move or any action the GM thinks might draw attention out of combat. The distance move depends entirely on the situation. The GM might want to roll every minute of the, if the group is sneaking around a perimeter of a defensive position or every few miles that they're trying to, quietly walk the path through a dark forest without alerting creatures that live there. So that's stealth and that's the fifth of the skills. So those are the five very important skills and I'm going to do some research. So I will get back to you all on the sneak attack because I'm going to have to see if that's a multi-action. And so I'm going to actually post it up on the, the Facebook forum because the forums are closed now. I, I miss the forums, but they were fun. Anyway, um, if you guys have any suggestions or questions or thoughts, go ahead and, and just comment below. Um, encourage people to like, subscribe, join. We want to build this community larger. This has been great having you guys here. We are almost up to 300 subscribers. We are at 200 and. 80 
five. Oh, wow. Or we even went up. 285. So that's even greater. Um, thank you, everybody who's subscribed so far. You guys are all just absolutely amazing. And let's let's keep this going. Let's build this community out. And let's make this our community for discussions and great things like that. Um, I do want to I do want to shout out to Wookie Rage. Um, Wookie Rage has been commenting a lot and and increasing the conversation. So definitely give you a shout out there and to everybody else who's commented and shared their thoughts and ideas. And I all want to know want you to know that I'm going to definitely be replying to every single comment that I get at least for the now and as best I can. So. Until next time, remember, I love you. You are amazing. You are a wonderful human being, and this planet is a better place for you being on it. And it doesn't matter what kind of hard times you're going through, it gets better. And we, as your club, are here to support you and, and love you and bring you through these hard times. So I hope to see you at my table. Until next time, this is Mason Emerson with Ace Roleplaying Games, signing off.